You can look at the clock. You can hope your oven is telling the truth. You can follow the commands precisely. You can guess. You can gash. You can poke. You can stab. But none of that's necessary when you know the 26 most important temperatures in all of cooking. Today on the Carefree Cooks Code. I'm Chef Todd Moore, and this is the Carefree Cooks Code every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. Here's our challenge. How can home cooks cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride while ignoring recipes and still impressing themselves and others with what they cook? Well, the answer is found in becoming empowered with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that work for any ingredient, for any diet, and any desire, just like chefs do. And we'll know we've cracked it when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health through better food and cooking. This is the Carefree Cooks Code. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Tuesday at noon again, and that means we're together for the Carefree Cooks Code. If this uh, surprises you somehow, you should have gone to webcookingclasses.com slash live and gotten involved with my message alert system because whenever I think of something in the kitchen or just, oh my God, I need to share this. This is such a great idea with people. I just jump on there live and send out a quick announcement. You won't always get an email. You won't always see it on Facebook, but I will send an announcement. So if you want to know when we're live, because I always see people here saying, oh, I missed it. I didn't see that one. Go to webcookingclasses.com slash Live. I see so many of our friends with us here today. Hello, Pamela Johnson. Welcome. Don Traub is with us after a long diagonal country trek. Uh, Michael Bernard is with us. Margaret and Jana. This is so good. Dave. Hey, Dave from the UK is here uh, on his 36th wedding anniversary. Very nice. Congratulations, Dave. Uh, Marie and Candy Gooden is here. Uh, Varia is here, Grammy and Timothy and Carrie, and I can't just read names, but all our old friends are here and our young friends, I, I meant friends of long standing, carefree cooks that have been with us for quite a while because we are the carefree cooks, we create our own recipes, we don't listen to someone else in that respect, right? We bring family and friends together. When your cooking is that good, <laughs> you're going to make friends. It's kind of like building a pool in the summer. Every, everyone's going to gravitate toward you. Uh, you learn every time you cook. Well, why bother? You know, If you're trying to relearn cooking every night of the week like a recipe does, then, you know, then go to a restaurant. But if you actually progress, you're a carefree cook. You define your own cooking style because you're practicing pro cooking methods. And you know what winds up happening? you wind up loving your cooking. That's it. And that's what we do here. We love our cooking. Uh, I've got a, a true or false for you today. It's a simple phrase, but I would like you to tell me in the comments section below, true or false, butter has 15% water in it. True or false in the comments section below. Butter has 15% water. Okay, I've got a lot to get to you today. And this is going to be really fun because it's one of those things that just like popped into my head, starts rolling around in my head for a while. And like I said, it's one of those ideas where like, oh my God, this is so cool. I have got to share it with everyone. And today's Carefree Cooks broadcast, it, it might be one of the most boring ones ever. <laughs> it, it's, doesn't that sound strange to hear me say that? It, this might be the most boring Carefree Cooks code ever. If you don't care how cooking works, right? Today, it might seem like me just reading a whole list of temperatures to you. But if you change your thought process a little bit, it really might be one of the most fascinating times that we've ever spent together. Because today I'm about to share with you the 26 most important temperatures in cooking. So what? Right? So what, Chef Todd? But bear with me. If you can get through the next few minutes of me reading temperatures to you, basically... But you're also going to walk away with a ton of aha moments because you're going to start to see the relationships between some of these temperatures and some of the mysteries in your mind are going to be solved today. This, this is the way it's going to work because I'm going to go over these temperatures and in your mind you're going to go, oh my goodness, that's why that happens. Oh my goodness, that's why that happens before that happens. That's why I can never do that until I do that. 
But if you think it's going to be boring, if you think it's just a list of temperatures, I don't know, then you're not going to get anything out of it. But if you listen to what I'm talking about today, it's going to connect in your mind. I'm telling you, because I used to do this in culinary school all the time. Culinary students got to know all these temperatures that we're going to go to. But I think it's going to be the best time that we ever spend together because there are so many answers to, to your questions in this list if you just know what to listen for, okay? Perky ears today, close the other windows, right? We don't have to keep up with our friends. Uh, we don't have to be on Skype at the same time. Just close the other windows because you're going to want to listen up. The associations, the lesson is going to be in your head today, not necessarily out of my mouth. And as a disclaimer, I have rounded some of these numbers. I have averaged some of these numbers. I'm giving you a general idea of when things happen in the kitchen. And ultimately, it's up to you to observe what's going on when you cook and make the adjustments for next time. And that's that's the path to carefree cooking, right? Right. All right. So let's get going. Where do you want to start with the 26 most important temperatures in all of cooking? Um, let's start at the bottom, okay? <laughs> let's start at the bottom and not give away all the answers at first. Uh, the very first temperature that we come to in these 26 temperatures is the temperature of what your home freezer should be. Zero degrees Fahrenheit or about minus 18 Celsius. Now, uh, you know, I, I recommend that uh, carefree cooks uh, not only have uh, thermometers in their oven, and we're going to talk about your refrigerator in a minute, but in your freezer. If, if you don't have a freezer thermometer in your freezer, what if like the power went out overnight and then came back the next day and everything is still hard and frozen? Would you be able to tell if those things had been, th those food items had been damaged or could be potentially hazardous in one way or another? Um, you should have a thermometer in your freezer so you can tell that the freezer is at a steady temperature. Now, I'll answer the question that I just asked because, yeah, what you would do if the power went out and refroze, you'd see a lot of ice crystals on things. The individually quick frozen shrimp, the IQF shrimp, would be one clump there. Um, items would settle if you had bags of things. They would seem lower. That's how you know without a thermometer, but my heavily suggested advice is get yourself a thermometer, put it in the freezer. Uh, the second is 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius, and this is when water freezes. This is how you make your ice cubes, all right? But keep in mind that water expands when it freezes. So a bottle of water filled to the top with a tight lid is going to blow up. Uh, an item that is filled with water is going to see a heavier freezer burn. Let's say you break down a whole chicken, like we teach in web cooking classes, and you've got pieces, legs, or, or chicken breasts that you want to cook at a later date. If you wash them and then put them right in the freezer with a lot of water, make them as wet as you can, that water freezes and expands and it breaks the muscle tissue of your meats and proteins. This is why vegetables, this is why freezing onions turns them into mush because when the water expands, it busts the cells. So if you do want to uh, freeze chicken or shrimp or beef, make sure it's as dry as possible. Next temperature, 38 degrees Fahrenheit, 3.3 degrees Celsius. This is the temperature that your home refrigerator should be at. Just about 5, 6 degrees Fahrenheit above freezing, but not quite past that because I'll explain that again. Now, uh, Carefree Cooks in, uh, in lesson number one of web cooking classes, everybody finds out, most people find out, that their oven has been lying to them. And I implore them to put a thermometer in your oven to always check the veracity of your oven. The same should be done with your refrigerator, but more than once. What I mean by that is one thermometer won't do it in your refrigerator, you should have at least three. One on the top shelf, one in the middle shelf, one on the bottom. One should be back toward the back of the refrigerator, one should be toward the front. Additionally, you might consider having a, a thermometer on the shelves on the door. You will be shocked at the difference in temperature from different zones in your refrigerator. But, but again, I'd have to ask you, if the power went down and you know your bacon went to 50 degrees overnight, making it potentially hazardous, and then the, the electricity came back on, how would you really know, right? So make sure you're always checking those ref, those temperatures in your refrigerator by putting a thermometer in there, and it should be about 38 degrees. Uh, the second, the next temperature uh, that we get to is 40 degrees Fahrenheit, or about four and a half degrees Celsius. This is the bottom of the temperature danger zone, 
TDZ is temperature danger zone. And this is where bacteria starts to grow. Now, below 40 degrees, bacteria is not killed. Bacteria is reduced to a safe level, and bacteria is held dormant at 40 degrees or below. But once you reach 40 Fahrenheit, 4.5 Celsius, ooh, that's when they start waking up. They start going, hey, what's going on here? What can I eat? What can I contaminate? You know, so bottom of the temperature danger zone, stuff that you do not want bacteria bacteria to grow has got to be 40 Fahrenheit or below. Oh, that rhymes. Maybe I should do that. If you don't want it to grow, 40 Fahrenheit or below. And anyway, you can read this a mnemonic device for you. No, no extra charge for that. Also at 40 degrees Fahrenheit, this is where you want to cool your leftovers within four hours. So if you've put out a buffet dinner for people or you're hosting the church group or something and you've got that pan of lasagna left, you got to find a way to get that down to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, four and a half Celsius within four hours for the same reason, because otherwise bacteria starts to grow. And under the right environment, under the right conditions, which we'll talk about in a minute, bacteria can double every 20 minutes. And I'll let you do quick math in your head. I'll tell you the answer in a minute. At, 40, uh, at uh, 88 degrees Fahrenheit or about 31 degrees Celsius, this is when chocolate melts, okay? This is why you don't leave chocolate bars in your car. <laughs> All right? This is why you don't leave them out on the, on the uh, shelf where the sun is coming in the window because chocolate is going to start to melt at this temperature. And I'm talking about real chocolate, okay? I'm not talking about the couverture that you coat things with. I'm not talking about white chocolate because white chocolate is an even chocolate. I'm talking about the thing that is made with only five ingredients, only with sugar, cocoa butter, cocoa liqueur, lecithin, and vanilla. That is it. A chocolate purist will not allow milk in there, okay? Somebody that really loves chocolate the way that I do, dark chocolate, sugar, cocoa butter, cocoa liqueur, lecithin as an emulsifier, and vanilla, that's it. But that's when uh, chocolate melts. At 93 degrees Fahrenheit, or about 33 degrees Celsius, this is when butter melts. Whole butter we'll talk about. Oh, and I don't want to give anything away because we're going to talk about that when we get to the true false answer, which was about butter today. So let me move on then. 98 degrees Fahrenheit, or 30 37 degrees Celsius, this is the human body. This is the temperature in your mouth. So now, all right, here's one of these aha moments I was thinking about. Do you understand why chocolate is so great that it melts in your mouth? Right? Because chocolate was 88 Fahrenheit. Your mouth is 98.6 Fahrenheit. That's why chocolate melts in your mouth. Do you understand now a little bit why when you do saute or when you bake pastries, when you make them with butter, it melts away. You get that butter mouth feel and, and that taste. Um, have you ever tried to eat a donut and drink iced tea? Donut is deep fried in a fat that melts at a temperature higher than 98 degrees Fahrenheit. So try that. This is why donuts and coffee go together. Because if you eat like a Krispy Kreme donut and then drink a cold liquid, you're going to have that, that fat. It's called nuomaline. It's an invert fat that they use in donuts very often in production. Um, and it's just going to, like your mouth is coated with fat and you need a hot liquid to wash that away. So first bit of aha, keep in mind where the temperature of your mouth sits on this scale because it's got a very important thing to do with all of cooking. And let me ask you this question. What if somehow we all became mutants, <laughs> mutant humans here in downtown Baltimore, Maryland, uh, and the temperature of your mouth changed? What if the temperature of your mouth went up 10 degrees and it was 108? What if it went down 10 degrees and it was only 88, right? Then things that melt in your mouth wouldn't. Things that would burn your mouth couldn't, it would change your entire perception of food. So the temperature of your mouth, believe it or not, is one of the most important temperatures in all of cooking. At 105 degrees Fahrenheit or about 41 degrees Celsius, this is where yeast starts to bloom. This is if you're going to uh, make a bread, a loaf, and you put your yeast in warm water with sugar to bloom the yeast, 105 Fahrenheit, 41 Celsius should be the temperature of the water. Uh, getting back to the body at 110 Fahrenheit, 43 Celsius, this is where the human skin burns. So if you touch something above 110, you're going to get a mark on your arm, and this is where the reaction is. So here's another aha moment for you. This is why you can't put your hand over steam, 
right? Your hand will burn very quickly, but it is why you can put your hand over like softly simmering water, the, the air in between. This is why you can't touch the burner on your stove, but you can hover your hand above the burner on your stove. It's the difference between 110 and below. Uh, also at 110 degrees Fahrenheit, 43 Celsius, this is where air, I'm sorry, eggs accept air best. In the bake shop, this is a royal temperature. <laughs> if you're a baker, you might have gotten that pun. I got it. There's royal icing in the bake shop that you use with egg white. Oh, it's such a geek. <laughs> <laughs> that was such a geeky chef joke. Okay, it's a royal temperature in, in the kitchen, in the bake shop, because if you're making icings, uh, if you're making like an Italian buttercream, if you are trying to emulsify things, um, eggs brought to 110 degrees Fahrenheit is where they accept the most air, is where they trap the most air. This is a key if you're making Yorkshire pudding. Dave, in the UK, you making Yorkshire pudding lately? 110 is where the eggs should be brought to. When I make my popovers here in the US, pretty much the same thing, I soak my eggs in warm water, whole eggs in warm water first, and then I uh, start the procedure. 110, the royal egg temperature. At 115, this is where your chocolate will burn, and it gets grainy. If every, anyone's ever tried to apply direct heat to chocolate, if you put chocolate in a pan without a, a water double boiler, uh, you'll know that it turns really, really grainy, and it burns. But here's another aha moment for you, and this is why working with chocolate is such an incredible skill. It doesn't start to melt until 88 degrees, we just talked about. But it burns and gets ruined at 115. What is that, 27 Fahrenheit? About, what, 12 degrees Celsius is the entire realm of chocolate from melting to burning? So if you're working with chocolate, if you're making tempering chocolate, making candies, making frostings, icings, that's a very short window to work within, and that's why it's a skill, really, to work with chocolate. At 125 degrees Fahrenheit, or 52 Celsius, this is where your proteins are rare. You want a rare steak, a rare something, cook it at 125. They're about, again, I'm rounding, so please don't comment, Chef Todd, my rare is 130. That's great, okay? Again, there's there's a leeway in here as well. At 125, 140 degrees Fahrenheit, this is where your proteins are medium. 140, 145, 138, somewhere in there, up to you entirely. At 140 degrees Fahrenheit or 60 Celsius, this is where you hot hold your fully cooked foods. So if you're setting up a buffet and you've cooked all the foods, um, and I know when I was a hospital chef, man, we used to take temperatures of things all the time, over and over again, constantly taking uh, temperatures of, of uh, steam table pans. Uh, but this is where your food has got to be hot held. If the uh, health department in your town goes to the local Chinese or Indian buffet, or American buffet for that matter, not trying to pick on them, and they stick their thermometer in the steam table and it comes out at 125, they will take all that food away and they'll write those people up. 140 is where your food should be held hot holding temperature. At 145 Fahrenheit or 63 Celsius, this is kind of interesting. This is an old school way to pasteurize milk. You would bring it to 145, keep it there. And this is hard, you know? The key to all of cooking is controlling the heat. So if you can bring something to a 145 degrees and hold it there, right, without it getting any hotter, uh, that's a skill. But for 30 minutes, you will kill the bacteria in milk and you'll pasteurize your milk. 145 for 30 minutes or 63 Celsius. 150, this is one of the four effects of heat on cooking. This is gelatinization of starches, a very important temperature in cooking. This is where you make sauces where the starch absorbs the liquid and swells. This is where you make rice. Rice absorbs the liquid and swells. Uh, this is where you make pastas, things like that, absorbs the liquid and swells. Gelatinization of starches, very important temperature in cooking. At 150 Fahrenheit, 65 Celsius, egg whites coagulate. Egg whites coagulate. This is why so few people can make a decent egg white omelet. I'll bet you a hundred bucks, go into your local diner or anywhere you have breakfast uh, and ask for an egg white omelet, it will be browned. They will brown it, they will burn it because egg whites coagulate at a lower temperature than egg yolks do. So if you want to do a real nice egg white omelet, lower that pan 
lower temperature than whole eggs or egg yolks. At 150 degrees, 65 Celsius, this is where your proteins are well done. Your steak is well done. It's a hockey puck, if you're asking my opinion. At 160 Fahrenheit or 71 Celsius, this is an appropriate poach. Now, Web Cooking Classes members in uh, Lesson Week 5, I think it is, learn about the important difference between boil, simmer, and poach. This is moist convective heat, but yet so many people think boil is the only way to cook in water. There's a big difference between boil, simmer, and poach. Uh, so poach starts at 160 Fahrenheit or 71 Celsius, and then at 162 Fahrenheit or 72 Celsius, this is where you can pasteurize eggs. So at home, now you can go out buy a commercial carton of pasteurized eggs, but if you want to make Caesar dressing, if you want to make a really classical Alfredo sauce, if you want to use eggs to uh, make your own mayonnaise, but you're a little skeeved out at the potential hazards of eggs, for 15 seconds, if you can hold your eggs at 162 for 15 seconds, you can kill the uh, bacteria and pasteurize them. What's the problem with this, though? What's the challenge? At 165, you're going to get scrambled eggs. <laughs> That's the challenge. So if you want to pasteurize your own eggs over a double boiler, and I've done this, you have to keep it in a three-degree realm. It's got to be 162 at least but not 165. Tough to do, man, tough to do. If you can do that, you're really controlling the heat. And that's something I would, I would put on a chef test. You know what that's like? That's a lot like making hollandaise sauce, right? If you can make a thickened egg sauce without scrambling it, you're controlling the heat really, really well. Also at 165 Fahrenheit, about 74 Celsius, this is where you start to destroy bacteria. This is the top of the temperature danger zone. So in between 40 Fahrenheit and 165 Fahrenheit, this is where bacteria loves to grow and multiply. I said it doubles every 20 minutes. That means in four hours you go from just a few to two, mil two million bacterium, and those are things that can definitely make you sick. So things are cooked to 165 or above to destroy bacteria or at least reduce it to a, a safe level for human beings. At 165 also, this is where you reheat leftovers safely. That church uh, picnic that I was talking about, you took the lasagna home, you want to bring it back, for, have lasagna for breakfast the next day, I don't know why, but okay, you've got to heat that now to 165 to make sure that that food is safe. Next temperature, 185 or 29 Celsius, this is where water simmers. Boil, simmer, and poach. But now we said 165 is where food is fully cooked, safe, and done, and a poach is about 160, and simmering is about 185. You'll start to get the more aha moments that maybe you should be controlling your moist cooking temperatures a little better than you are. Uh, 185 Fahrenheit, 29 Celsius is also when a whole bird is fully cooked and done. You would take the temperature between the leg and the breast or the breast and the ribs, whether you're cooking a whole turkey or a whole chicken, something like that. This is when your whole poultry is finished. And now, when we start to get above 200 degrees, we start to talk about things changing state. And at 212 Fahrenheit or 100 Celsius, Water boils. We all know this. It boils, it turns to steam, it enters the atmosphere. A very important <laughs> temperature in all of cooking. Evaporation of moisture is how you dry stuff out. Evaporation of moisture is how you make stuff crispy if you want to. Controlling moisture in cooking is got to be one of the top two or three things that you should be trying to do. And people that can control the heat and can control the loss of moisture, those are the people that are better cooks. But now we get again into stage changing and at 235 degrees Fahrenheit or about 113 Celsius, we get to a soft ball sugar stage. Anyone that makes icings or candies or things like that knows that at this stage, this is like um, uh, gummy bears, okay? So if you boil sugar, uh, mixed with a little water to dissolve it. The water is going to leave at 212 Fahrenheit, right? Evaporate, turn to steam, and all that's left is that sugar. You bring the sugar to 235 or 113, you get little gummy bear kind of things, and you can make candies if you want. Uh, the next one is called hardball sugar stage. If you want a sucking candy, a lifesavers kind of thing, a hard candy, you bring that sugar to 255 Fahrenheit or 122 Celsius. Uh, the next one 
as soft crack sugar stage. If you want to make peanut brittle, this is the temperature that you bring your pre peanut brittle to, to 70 Fahrenheit, 132 Celsius. And the next is caramelization of sugars. This is how you would make your sugar brown and make caramel out of it. It's also how we put the grill marks on our hamburgers. It's also how we put that nice color on a sauteed chicken breast. One of the four effects of heat on food and a very important temperature in cooking. Okay, so that's our sugar group there. And if you're a bake shop person, if you're a candy maker, those are four temperatures you have got to know to make good candy out of it. But it doesn't stop there because at 350 Fahrenheit or 177 Celsius, butter will start to burn. But <laughs> butter is made up of three elements. I'm not going to tell you in what proportion because that's our true false today, but it's not really the butter that burns. Like the, the, the milk fat is not the thing that burns because that would be an oil heated up. You would never say it burns. You would say it smokes like an oil does. What burns at 350 degrees Fahrenheit are the milk solids in whole butter. And this is why people saute with clarified butter, saute with ghee. The milk fat doesn't burn, the milk solids burn. Um, this is why baking, a lot of high heat baking items, if you've ever made little uh, wafer cookies or pirouette cookies that, that go in a high oven very quickly and then they get molded, you want to cook with clarified butter because they will brown too quickly because of the milk solids in there. You, you under, <laughs> I said it might be boring or it might be great. I just dropped some tremendous information on you about butter and it just, blah, it just came out of my mouth that way. <laughs> Next one, 360, uh, 182 Celsius extra virgin olive oil smokes. There is a whole list of smoking points of oils. I didn't want to get into the whole thing today about all different types of oils. You can look that up, but basically between 350 degrees Fahrenheit and 480 degrees Fahrenheit, all oils will smoke at some point in there. 350 to 480, but 480 is where clarified butter smokes. Look at the difference between butter being burned at 350 and clarified butter smoking at 480, it's 130 degrees Fahrenheit, 80 something degrees Celsius. That shows you the impact that the milk solids have on whole butter because butter is a combination of three different things. And, you know, <laughs> I know a lot of people are going to ask me for that last slide. I, I, I can hear this one. There we go. There's all. There's actually 37 lines on that slide. I had a blast making that yesterday. <laughs> if you want to know how I spent most of my day yesterday, it was making that slide. Um, I know people are going to want that. So for members of web cooking classes, I'm going to go ahead and put that as a resource in our Carefree Cooks community. So all the lifetime members of web cooking classes can try and put that into use into their own kitchens, into their own cooking as possible. Give me a little time to get it in a PDF usable form, but I will post that before you start asking, can I have that? Can I have that? I will post that in the Carefree Cooks community. So all members of web cooking classes can get a copy of it. Look for me to post that later on today. Uh, it's time for the dish of the week. And I start going through our Carefree Cooks community, uh, looking for the people that are cooking with some of these important temperatures, with the effects of heat on food. And the first one I came up with, oh my goodness, this looks so good. Paul says he upped his game when it comes to breakfast. He did eggs and bay scallops with a hollandaise sauce. Well, we just talked about the difference between eggs being safe eggs scrambling, coagulation of proteins, and eggs being able to emulsify on those temperatures, right? 110 uh, for accepting air and emulsifying, uh, one, uh, 165 for coagulating. Anyway, I wanted to congratulate Paul because he made a great hollandaise sauce using those effects of heat on food. Um, Jerry's roasting a whole chicken on the barbecue. Well, you need to know finished internal temperatures for that, right? Jerry's not going to, I hope he's not going to gash that chicken open in the middle to see if the breast meat is still red. I hope he'd use a thermometer, and that's one of the most important effects of heat on food at 165. Charlie says he's having way too much fun being a carefree cook because he's making meatballs for the first time instead of meat sauce. Charlie's always made meat sauce before, and in all his years of cooking, he's like, why didn't I make meatballs? So he is now. Of course, what does Charlie need? He needs a binding agent 
in his meatballs, probably an egg. So the coagulation of proteins stiffening the egg, holding the meatballs together, another of the four effects of heat on food. Uh, Brian is figuring out how to use gelatinization of starches, 150 degrees Fahrenheit, and he's using short grain rices along with the risotto method to make Spanish rice, he said, has always eluded him. I've always wanted to make Spanish rice. It's always eluded me. Well, Brian's making it now. And Jeffrey, he made one of my favorite sandwiches in the world, especially in Paris. He made a croque madame. Uh, to do the croque madame, you got to make a bechamel sauce, gelatinization of starches. You got to fry the egg, coagulation of proteins. Looks like a little caramelization of uh, sugars on there today as well. You got to make crispy bread. That's caramelization of sugars. There's a lot of temperatures going on there in his dish. Congratulations. Thank you so much for everyone that is uh, submitting their, their carefree inspirations in our Carefree Cooks community. This is, if you want to begin your own path, this is the way it works. You become a member of web cooking classes. You become a lifetime member of web cooking classes. You get involved in the Carefree Cooks community. Everybody in there is encouraging. They're helpful. They give each other ideas. It's been really, really a lot of fun. Uh, going back to the uh, true or false today, butter is 15% water. That's, that was the uh, statement today. Well, you know, butter, butter's not one thing, but butter's three things, like I said. And butter is really, if you think about it, it is highly concentrated milk. <laughs> you wouldn't think that butter is milk, but yes, butter is milk. It's just really, really concentrated because it takes about five gallons of milk to make about two pounds of butter. But then when you take that five gallons of milk, there's, there's residual product. There's skim milk and buttermilk. There's about four and a half gallons of skim milk and buttermilk left in the process. And years ago, it used to be thrown away. It's, it was useless. Or they would feed it to farm animals, right? It would be used for feed. But with the advent of skim milk and the market share, the popularity, the demand for skim milk, it's more valuable than ever. So all of the milk gets used today. But the answer to this is true. Uh, butter is anywhere from 80 to 85 cent, uh, percent milk fat. 2 to 5% milk solids, the things that we talked about burn the most quickly, sometimes referred to as curd, right, milk curd, and 15 to 20% water. That's why when you clarify butter, if you take a pound of butter and clarify it, it has a 75% yield. You'll wind up with 12 ounces of clarified butter when you remove that 15% water and that 5 to 10% of milk solids as well. So it's been a blast today. What did I tell you? It, you either thought that was boring <laughs> because I read a whole bunch of temperatures, and if you did, you've signed off, or you are part of the 156 people still with us because you want to know the keys to cooking. And this is the way Carefree Cooks cook. We use the confidence that we have in dependable methods of cooking along with the creativity that it brings out in us. So we start inventing an endless number of original dishes using these temperatures, using how cooking works, things that we are always very proud of. And pride is a big part of being a carefree cook because when you know what tomorrow's chefs are learning in culinary school, you can start bringing those concepts into your own home and you can cook just like they do. So if you know someone who wants to know 26 of the most important temperatures in cooking, like this video, please give me hearts, give me love, give me thumbs. Thumbs up, hopefully, because then Facebook knows that it's worthwhile and it's going to help people as well. Um, as well as uh, my class going on this week is uh, the five skills taught in culinary school that are essential in all of cooking. Uh, you should join us this week because this is a class that many of you have already taken. I know if you haven't, it changes people's lives. It's not hard, okay? You don't need any prior skills. It's totally free to you. And all you got to do is go to webcookingclasses.com slash skills and uh, find a time that's best for you. You can hold your spot right now. Webcookingclasses.com slash skills and find a class time that is right for you. It's Chef Todd Moore saying I had a great time today. I hope you got a lot out of it as well. I'm going to get working on that sheet. But remember, there's always a method to your cooking success. See you next Tuesday, everyone.